uh, thank you for taking a Saturday, uh, spending a Saturday with us. And uh, this is actually uh, the first time uh, our group, Asian Heart and Vascular Center, AHVC, is doing a, our a ASM, uh, annual scientific uh, meeting online uh, due to the COVID-19 restrictions. So uh, this year will be the virtual uh, cardiac series where we are doing a series of talks in the next two days. Uh, today there will be two sessions and tomorrow will be two sessions. So for the two sessions today, myself and my colleague, Dr. Tan chong Sok, who is currently not available because he's attending to a cardiac emergency, uh, will be co-hosting the first session, followed by a little break before uh, Dr. Stanley Chia comes on board for the second session. So the first uh, talk that we're going to have today, uh, the speaker is Dr. Chan Chuan Hong, our medical director. I think most of you all know who he is and he probably doesn't need further introduction. But I think uh, for those who still are not very familiar with Dr. Chuang, he uh, used to be, prior to coming to private practice, he was a senior consultant in the National Heart Center. And uh, he also did his uh, training in heart failure, heart transplant, and genetic heart disease in Cleveland Clinic. And he also went for a sabbatical to do further training in cardiac and peripheral uh, CT in the Lenox Hill Hospital in New York. So Dr. Chuang spearheaded this uh, cardio-oncology service in AHVC for the past two, three years. And I remember very vividly we attended a session together in Washington two years ago uh, in winter. It was really cold, uh, but we learned quite a lot of things. And we realized that this is a very important field for not just the specialists like cardiologists and oncologists, but also very important, equally important for GPs who are looking after all these patients in the primary health care to be aware of what are the risks associated with their treatment, what are the things to look out for, and maybe they may be the first point of contact when their patients may have to be sent back to see either the cardiologist or the oncologist. So I think without further ado, uh, Dr. Chuang can uh, start the session rolling today and uh, he will be presenting on uh, advanced cardiology, uh, on cardio-oncology services. Dr. Chuang. Um, can you see my slide? Uh, right now, we can see you very clearly. And my slide? Uh, not yet. Can someone switch to? Uh, you need to have you share screen. Uh, maybe you want to hop over. Hi, good afternoon. Share screen. Uh, Jeremy, you need to. My thing can. Yeah. Start. Okay. Okay. Now we can see your slide, Dr. Chong. Okay. Uh, sorry, I can't see you. I can only see my slides. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks for joining. Uh, joining us in this afternoon's uh webinar. Uh, this I'm a bit uh, apprehensive because this is my first webinar since COVID started. I'm not used to talking to the computer by myself. Um, today, what I'd like to actually share with you all is our, um, our experience of managing and looking after patients with cancer. And as Jeremy has alluded to earlier, it is not just an uh, individual effort because the field of oncology has uh, expanded so rapidly that there are um, many different impact on uh, various systems, whether it's a cardiovascular, a respiratory, or even endocrine, and uh, oftentimes the team concept. So uh, working with each other is very important. Now, cardiovascular and uh, disease and cancer are actually the two most prevalent disease in the developed world. And evidence has shown that these conditions are interlinked through common risk factors, uh, such as an aging, aging population. And on top of that, anti-cancer therapy can cause a wide spectrum of short and long-term cardiotoxic effect. Now, before I go further to talk uh, about this advancing care, I would just like to intro, uh, thank my team. Uh, uh, besides me, there's Dr. Stanley Chia, Dr. Tan Chong-Hyo, both are interventional cardiologists, Dr. 
Jeremy takes care of electrophysiology problems. Dr. Go and Dr. Chan Wan Sen looks after ladies and cardiovascular care. Uh, recently, we have two mentors uh, joining us as well, Dr. Uh, Dr. Arthur Tan and Dr. Richard Ng. Without them, we wouldn't have come so far. Um, so non-communicable diseases actually have been responsible for most of the death in uh, both developed and developing world. It contributes to about 63% of the problems. Now, if we look at the dollars and cents of these chronic diseases, we know that actually uh, many of these um, uh, modifiable behavior risk factors such as tobacco uh, smoking, physical inactivity, unhealthy diets, uh, all contribute significantly to the non communicable diseases. And if you can control them, you can actually reduce the uh, incidence of uh, cardiovascular disease by as much as 80% and also cancer by as much as 40%. The mortality from cardiovascular diseases and cancer, the two largest cause of death among the non-communicable diseases, has slowly decreased over time. And in fact, if you look at whether it's the people less than 65 years old or the people above 65 years old, the mortality has reduced. But in those above age of 65 years old, cardiovascular diseases, still more people still die from cardiovascular diseases than from cancer alone. Now, if you look at the current uh, states uh, in the United States, the number of cancer survivors is increasing year by year. And by 2010, that's uh, 10 years ago, one in every 25 adults may actually be a survivor of malignant diseases. And the thing is that uh, cancer and cardiovascular things has many things in common. And most of this cancer are actually diagnosed in people above the age of 60. So, uh, that's more. Uh, uh, that's the reason why there are many things in common. And if you look at women, uh, a lot of people still think that if you ask women on the street, many people still think that cancer is the leading cause of death. When every year there are more people dying from cardiovascular disease and cancer alone in the United States. And in fact, one in two women will probably die from heart disease as compared to one in twenty-five women from breast cancer. So. The thing is, many of these messages are driven much by the media and the industry, and a lot of people will actually overlook their other rest of cardiovascular risks uh, in this day and age. Um, while those people actually survive, all right, but many people actually survive cancer at greater risk of cardiovascular disease than the general population. Survivorship comes with a cost, and the cost may be a cardiovascular event. All right, so. If you look at all the cancer survivors, the cardiovascular disease still account for half of non-cancer related mortality after they were diagnosed to have cancer. And this is quite common. And uh, oftentimes we feel uh, we are faced with the difficulty of managing um, whether or not to withdraw, uh, whether or not to cut down cancer treatment uh, with due consideration for the deterioration in the cardiovascular status. If you look at the childhood cancer statistics, all right, uh, every day, six children will die of uh, childhood cancer. And it is number one cause of death disease in the United States more than other diseases combined. But this day and age, many of these childhood cancer survive, they do survive to adulthood. In fact, the survivorship right now, the, uh, yeah, for them to, the five-year survival for childhood cancer has increased from 30% to 80% as it, as it is now. But the thing about it is that two-thirds of those who survive the childhood cancer face at least one chronic health issues. And one quarter of these survivors face a late effect from treatment that is classified as severe or life-threatening. So what we wanted to say is childhood cancer is for life, meaning that you don't just actually treat the childhood cancer, but you have actually to manage their, um, their health issues for life. Now, this is a recently published paper which actually illustrates the incidence of uh, 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 the survivorhood of childhood cancer, that a five-year survivor is at least 83%, but at least 10% of them develop heart failure some 40 years after the diagnosis of, after the treatment for childhood cancer. As I said earlier, uh, there are things uh, linking both cancer as well as cardiovascular disease, but uh, in part, part of the reason uh, is the aging factor. 
four out of uh, four out of five adults above age of sixty five will have some some form of chronic conditions, and most of the cancers are diagnosed. Yeah, sixty percent are diagnosed in people age sixty five, and these are the people at greatest risk of cardiovascular disease. If you look at the cancer link to the cardiovascular disease, some of the links are actually in part through the dietary smoking, uh, smoking, lack of activity, hypertension, high sugar level. In part, if you look at the geographic distribution of this risk factor, it very much matches that of cancer uh, death rate in the in United States. So there's some kind of link intricately linking the two conditions. Now, while we first since the first report of uh, doxorubicin having an effect on uh, anthracycline, having an effect on patients undergoing treatment and developing heart failure way back in 1967, uh, there's actually not been much, there's been more knowledge, but no actual guideline or, or consensus statement that's been published by all the various bodies. It wasn't until 2011, that's 40 years from the first uh, uh, documented report that uh, the, the publication suddenly increased. So cancer and cardiovascular disease, the two planets really uh, clash after 2011. And since then, you can see from here, some of the many, many papers that were uh, published by the various bodies, whether it's the American Society of Clinical Oncology or European Society of uh, Cardiology or ASMO. Uh, but the thing is, even though there's a lot of guidelines, um, there's still a lot of controversy, and that's what I wanted to address in today's talk. Now, uh, one of, uh, excuse me. So my first endeavor with uh, setting up cardio-oncology service was way back in 2008 after I left uh, National Heart Center. At that time, uh, that, that was uh, around the time when the, the small molecule inhibitors were uh, being developed, and uh, I was invited to be on Asia Pacific uh, advisory committee for some of these uh, uh, newly developed drug. But a lot has actually moved on since then, and there's still a lot more for us to actually learn. Now, one of the first things we need to do is to actually understand each other's jargons. Modern medicine is full of jargons, and many a times, the communication between the physician and cardiologist, and as well as the oncologist, doesn't quite go hand in hand. So for example, the cardiologist might talk about heart failure, preserve ejection fraction, uh, dual antiplatelet therapy, drug eluting stand, TAV, uh, ARNI, uh, pulmonary vein isolation, and GLS, and to the oncologist, they say, what, the, what is that, you know? And to the cardiologist, when the oncologist talk about neoadjuvant therapy, uh, oncotypin, MRD, PFS, proton kinase inhibitors, and things like that, uh, it's also, uh, you know, uh, some may not actually fully understand the impact on the patient's life. So GSM stands for Gong Simi or Dia Bo Kiu, you know. Uh, really, I think it is important for us to sit down together and actually talk to each other about uh, how we actually manage patients and clarify and avoid using jargons. No. So one of the questions that actually was asked was, how is cardiotoxicity defined across standard organization? Has there been a consistent definition? Is there a lot of variety of a slight variation? Or is there a considerable variation in the definition? Or is there any clear cut definition right now? The answer is actually no. And why is this important? Because if we don't clarify the definition of cardiotoxicity, then we'll never be able to optimize the patient from preempting the early impact on the heart, as well as the diagnosis and management, as well as monitoring for late impact. So definition is very important because if you don't clarify, then how are the patients going to trust us? You know, um, the patients will probably ask, uh, what is important to them? Is it the EF or is it the blood pressure? And then the patients uh, will be wondering, hey, does uh, my doctor know what he's doing or not? Or is the doctor playing a uh, guessing game? So um, that is one of the things that still exists as of now, controversies in the definition of cardiotoxicity. Do we really care? Now, if we really care, because uh, definition is important, as I mentioned earlier, that allows us to decide, okay, uh, what is considered as early disease? And then what are the things that we want to look out for in terms during the management and how do we follow up the patient? 
If you look at the spectrum of cardiotoxicity, I call it the clinical phenotyping. You can have different drugs causing things from heart failure that we most of us would know to angina or coronary artery disease, to stroke, to peripheral artery disease, to uh, arrhythmias like atrial fibrillation and ventricular arrhythmias, to um, uh, thromboembolic phenomena. This is a full spectrum of cardiotoxicity that cause for full different subspecialties to come together and actually manage the patient. Cardiotoxicity is not just about heart failure. But if you look at FDA guidelines, the FDA guidelines for different drugs differs. For doxorubicin-related uh, left ventricular dysfunction, the definition of dysfunction means 10% below the low limit of normal or EF less than 45%. For the pediatric age group uh, studies, they define a, a drop in fractional shortening by more than 10%, a drop, uh, a drop below 29%, and decline in EF to less than 55%. For the, uh, for the study on Herceptin Trastuzumab, uh, the FDA stipulated a guideline that uh, absolute LVEF decrease of more than 16% from pretreatment failure or decline of more than 10% to a value below the institution's lower limits of normal. So basically, there isn't a standardized guideline to defining what is actually cardiotoxicity. It varies from one drug to another. And, 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 you know, that's not the how we all uh, physicians actually work. You know, we need more standardized guidelines in order for us to conduct clinical trials and help the patients institute the treatments that are necessary. So it's like, you know, I'm donor, but it's not a donor from suits, but actually Donald Trump. Uh, it's very difficult when each of them can say uh, quite the same thing, but not exactly the same thing. So it's very difficult in clinical practice to decide when do we actually institute treatment. Some were suggesting that perhaps a more universal definition is to classify by, okay, what is the timing of the uh, impact on the patient, whether it's acute, early or late, uh, what is the type of population adult or pediatric, what is the uh, cause of the impairment, which type of drugs, and lastly, what are the affected substrate or what I personally term as clinical phenotyping. All right. So this is the very uh, first report in 1967 on the study uh, on doxorubicin inducing congestive heart failure. But we know that in medicine, while we try to aim for do no harm, while we, if we can't bring any good to a patient, do no harm, many a times, many of these treatment or so-called targeted treatment have collateral damages, what we call on-target effect, as well as off-target side effects on the rest of the system. Uh, we can't, this day and age, we cannot say it's uh, not SBS means not si wei sui, you know, very unlucky. It can't be unlucky because we physicians need to know and need to follow up all the new drugs that have been developed and preempt what might be wrong, uh, what the patient is going to face. So overall, I, dis I describe, uh, I'll classify the cardiotoxicity clinical phenotyping into the various groups you see here, but today I'll just touch on two of them, which is congestive heart failure and rhythm, uh, because these are the ones that we actually see quite a lot in our daily clinical practice. Congestive heart failure, uh, well, in the past, uh, this, uh, uh, it was divided, uh, it was sometime in um, uh, you were and, uh, and the colleagues actually proposed that they are being divided in two types. One is called type one, uh, uh, cardiac dysfunction, one is called type 2 cardiac dysfunction. Now, there are many drugs that are, we know of doxorubicin or anthracycline class of drugs. There are many class of drugs that all can cause various degree of uh, congestive heart failure, from anthracycline to alkylating agents like iphosphamide to small molecules like sunitinib, uh, which is sutan, and, uh, and imatinib, glivac, and all these things all actually have a potential according cardiac dysfunction. It's a matter of whether we actually notice it or not. Now, anthracycline has been the most studied um, class of drugs. In the early years, we used to think that because of the generation of excess reactive oxygen, uh, reactive oxygen uh, species, uh, it causes damage to the uh, heart muscle. But in more recent years, we realized that what is uh, one of the mechanisms of action is actually that it binds to topoisomerase 
uh, uh, enzyme, and in that it leads to uh, defects in the DNA uh, replication. It causes the DNA breaks, and also it leads to uh, transcription changes that lead to defective mitochondrial biogenesis, as well as uh, also concurrently an uh, increase in reactive oxygen species generation. All these then result in the cardiomyocyte showing myocardial myofibril disarray and vacuolization and eventually death. And because there's death and there's reduced replacement, what happens is that oftentimes you think the damage is irreversible. All right. And then there's this other class of drugs where we classify them as reversible damages. Reversible damages are such that uh, there's actually no cell death per se, but it actually affects the, it actually affects the the mitochondrial function leading to an impairment in the heart function. And among this group of drugs, the perceptin class of drugs are commonly being implicated and some of the small molecules as well. Now, this is a very, very, uh, this is a more recent study uh, done by Swain in 2003. But the first generation of uh, so-called plotting the impact of uh, anthracycline dose to cardiac toxicity was actually done um, done way back in uh, 1979, whereby at that time they thought the incidence of uh, heart failure at various cumulative doses of doxorubicin uh, was 3%, 7%, and 18% at doses of 400, 4, uh, 550, and 700. Thereby, the oncologists then limit their uh, uh, cumulative anthracycline use to about 550 milligrams per meter square. But in a more recent study that was done uh, in this paper here in 2003, they realized the incidence of cardiotoxicity is actually higher than uh, estimated. That in part is because of the current uh, ability of us to actually image the patients. So the cumulative, uh, the risk of heart failure went up from 3, 7, and 18 to 5, 16, and 26 uh, percent in uh, patients receiving a highest dose of doxorubicin. Thereby, uh, since then, they have actually modified or tried to reduce the use of cumulative anthracycline dose to 400 to 450 uh, milligram, uh, milligram per meter square. But when we want to manage the patient, prevention is always better than cure. First of all, before we start the patient on any treatment, especially when most of them are elderly, we need to look at what is the existing cardiovascular risk as well as any, uh, any cardiovascular problem. Uh, that might put them at higher risk and then we might need to screen them more closely. Now, in terms of screening, is there any, been any development? Because um, despite the routine tracking, uh, many of us just think of cardiotoxicity or screening as ejection fraction. But despite the routine tracking of ejection fraction to adjust the drug dosing, some patients and many patients still develop severe left ventricular dysfunction. And, um, I just want to talk about this screening because this is what we do uh, day to day. Now, EF is right at the end. By the time you see a drop in EF, you have a drop in the, you already have significant impact on the heart muscle. What we want to look for is early damages, whether we can pick up from um, biomarkers or cellular markers or molecular markers, because the earlier we can actually uh, detect these changes, that will have an impact on the more. Uh, 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 survivorship uh, later that I will allude to. Okay. So this is a uh, traditional uh, method of um, doing is actually 2D echo because it's easily available. But however, many people fail to realize that it is load dependent, heart rate dependent, and dependent on the image quality. Patients post op may not have a good image. Patient too obese also will not have good image. But more importantly, uh, there's too much geometric assumption and as well as reader experience. Now you compare this with two, 3D echo, which was introduced sometime back in 2000 and, uh, 2005, 2006, when it was used more popularly with the newer generation of uh, machines. The variability, inter-observer variability between 3D echo is uh, less than 5.6%. And for 2D, it's as much as 10%. So if you have a guideline where it says that the, the, if the change in the EF is by more than 10%, uh, that person is con considered suffering from cardiotoxicity, but this could well be due to the inter-observer variation. But 3D is not something that many people have routinely in their clinic. There are also other tools uh, such as MUGA, 
uh, uh, cardiac magnetic resonance imaging and things like that. In fact, the earlier studies were all done using uh, 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 coin uh, as a cardiac toxicity. It was coined by Alexander back in 19, uh, in the earlier days using MUGA. But many of these uh, techniques are not, uh, may not be easily uh, available to patients and also it carries with it some radiation. So by and large, echo is still the choice. However, if you are able to improve an echo, uh, different methods of screening we might be able to pick up the early diseases. So one of the things that we actually started working on was strain imaging as early as 2003 when we were using this to actually identify the type of patient who are actually derived benefit from, uh, from this uh, cardiac resynchronization therapy. As well as in patients uh, to detect the early amyloid diseases, we find that strain imaging is actually quite useful a tool there's longitudinal strain, there's also circumferential and radial strain, but in clinical studies, we find that uh, 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 a longitudinal strain or GLS in short has a most uh, predictive value. And so this is a study whereby you can see that the patient's baseline EF was 61%, his GLS was minus 20. If you don't have a previous GLS, anything uh, 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 less than uh, minus 19 or 18, that means more negative is actually normal, all right? Uh, Pre-therapy uh, pre EF was 61%. After six months of treatment, EF was 55%. If you go by the old criteria uh, of more than 10% drop, well, this is not really more than 10% drop. However, the GLS already has dropped by uh, to minus 17. And currently we use at least 10, 15% change from the baseline GLS to actually tell us that, to, to suspect that there's early, uh, early impact on the heart muscle. And so even at least six months, there was early suggestion. And once you actually flag up to the oncologist that there might be a possible impact on the heart. And by 12 months, the EF drops further and you can see that the GLS actually declined further. If you were able to combine that with the biomarkers, we know that Certain patients undergoing chemotherapy, they might have, uh, they might have some uh, damage to heart muscle exemplified by an increase in troponin level. And if the patient had uh, no troponin rise during the early phase of uh, high dose chemotherapy, um, many of them actually remain quite well. Um, for those who have transient rise, uh, but subsequently disappear, there is some impairment in the heart function. The worst group will be those with persistent rise in troponin uh, even after a couple of weeks after the uh, chemotherapy. These are the groups that you need to keep a close watch on for development of heart failure. Anti-pro-BNP has been used for diagnosing heart failure, uh, quite uh, advanced heart failure. But for patients with uh, preserved ejection systolic function, for patients with early, um, early myocardial dysfunction, uh, some has actually postulated that it could also be used as a sensitive marker. Uh, but every, honestly, every patient serves as a baseline because in cancer patients, you must understand it's not just about the heart. They can also be at risk of pulmonary embolism from other reasons, uh, risk of DVT. And in those cases, pro-BMP levels may not always all be normal. So one always use the patient's baseline as a yardstick. If we are able to combine uh, the biomarkers with the strain imaging, we are able to increase our predictive value um, of whether or not the patient is suffering from early left ventricular dysfunction by as much as uh, 98%. So once we know, what do we do? Does it translate to a, a, a measure that we can help to improve the survival outcome? Uh, well, uh, there are some debates about it. Yes, although we, there are some uh, so-called preventive measures we can do. One is to deal with uh, using uh, alternative agents, uh, uh, changing the infusion regimen, are using alternative preparation of the drug. Uh, some of this have shown uh, uh, effect in reducing the cardiotoxicity and very much once we highlight to the primary oncologist, they will do the necessary. Uh, some have actually started, um, FDA have actually approved uh, uh, dextrazosin for the use of uh, chelating agent for the use in patients with metastatic uh, breast cancer. Uh, receiving uh, above 300 uh, milligram per uh, meter square of uh, doxorubicin, but it's not widely used. Um, I think locally in Singapore, uh, experience is not a lot. Some have also concerns about is reducing the, the uh, clinical efficacy of the drugs, and also more importantly, the impact on the 
uh, myelosuppression. Uh, how about standard heart failure therapy? Well, I think uh, what got me interested in onco uh, cardio oncology is actually way back in the, uh, uh, 2006, uh, 2004, 2006, when the first paper came out that uh, if we give carvedilol to a group of patients going through chemotherapy, uh, these uh, patients receiving carvedilol as compared to placebo will be able to have less impact of uh, intact LV systolic function. That got me interested. And the last group, antioxidant supplement, is something that we refuse to talk too much most of the time with our patients. But you know, most patients will always, always from their friends and relatives want to discuss whether they can use this supplement or that supplement or antioxidant. But what really got us interested is way back in 2005, when we were managing two patients one with uh, radiation-related cardiomyopathy and one with chemo-related cardiomyopathy, lying next to each other in heart center. And we were on the verge of trying to put them on uh, mechanical heart device. And uh, this uh, uh, support, and uh, somehow the wife or the patient bought the cactus juice and the patients after drinking uh, actually improved significantly. So it got us to wonder, you know, are we thinking too in the box and not thinking out of the box? And so we never close our mind to uh, exploring uh, certain things which I'll talk about later. Now, anthracycline, as I mentioned, the oncologist will either you know, space out the interval or instead of giving a high, uh, high infusion, uh, uh, give it slowly. Uh, like my uh, um, late mom-in-law, you know, even though we have no other drugs we use, we have to space out the uh, doxorubicin in small little doses so as not to have uh, too much impact on the heart. Now, what can we do if we see that uh, does treatment actually help to uh, improve the cardiac function? The answer is, well, at this, uh, at this moment, the evidence are moderate, meaning that uh, in some of these clinical studies that I showed down here, uh, the use of ACE inhibitors and beta blockers have shown to actually improve the heart function after, after you give it to the patient. But the key thing, uh, as highlighted in this paper by uh, uh, Cardinelli, um, is that the most important thing is actually early detection of uh, the impact of, on the impact, uh, impact on the heart. Because if you are able to detect uh, left ventricular dysfunction early, these are the people that are more likely to uh, rec uh, respond to treatment, whether it's a full recovery or partial recovery. Those who found, their, found themselves to have a left ventricular dysfunction at a much later stage, don't usually uh, have a good long-term outcome. They, they don't respond that well. So the key thing is early detection and then early institution of the treatment according to our current heart failure guideline. All right. So does it make a difference? Yes. If you look at this, uh, this, uh, this, this, this case example, 40-year-old man with uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma given uh, child plus rituximab, which is cyclophosphamide, idromycin, vincristine, and prednisolone. And uh, after three months, found to have a reduction in the GLS. EF is low normal. 3D says it's still normal, but you know you can start to start to get worried because the GLS is starting to drop. And uh, after instituting the treatments at 12 months, we see an improvement in the GLS and as well as the EF. So treatment does work, but then of course, um, many a times. There's, uh, it varies from patient to patient because of genetic variability and also their underlying heart conditions and also where, uh, 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 whether they are on all the uh, recommended uh, heart failure treatment. You know. So this is the current evidence whereby in terms of prevention of uh, LV or trying to reduce the LV dysfunction, uh, adjustment in the cancer drug is useful. Uh, but sometimes uh, the use of ACE inhibitors and beta blockers, well, modest uh, evidence or uh, strength or effect. Some have suggested that statins might help to reduce the, uh, the, uh, the incidence of heart failure in women with breast cancer. And some have uh, a small study have also used uh, aldosterone antagonists uh, to show benefit, but the evidence is still uh, relatively small. But all in, I think the uh, most important thing is that we have to balance the, 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 the continuation of drug treatment versus the, versus the, the detrimental uh, effect that might uh, come as a result. That means trying to balance the survival due to heart failure versus the survival due to a change 
or stopping of uh, cancer treatment. It's not an easy task. So patients are known, undergoing chemotherapy are cl uh, classified in the stage A. Uh, this, this group of patients, before that, they don't have any problem. But there are many patients who subsequently show a decline in the heart function, but asymptomatic, those in the stage B, uh, these are the ones that we really want to implement the right treatment, ACE or ARB plus beta blocker. Now, if you look at the current evidence, some people have started using ARNI or the other heart failure tr trials in, uh, in patients with impaired heart function. But honestly, there is actually no clinical studies yet using ARNI in these patients with heart failure. We use it in good faith because of the heart failure guideline, but the uh, evidence still go more for ACE or ARB. ACE such as inanapril, ARB such as valsaltan, beta blocker, there's more evidence for tabetolol as compared to the other beta blockers. Uh, advanced heart failure, I have to talk about this because uh, as many of y'all know, I lost my mother-in-law two weeks ago. Uh, she had breast cancer 17 years and survived with hardly any, uh, not uh, survived bravely, uh, but there wasn't much of a choice to the patient. Now, patients will develop advanced heart failure because of congestive, uh, because of chemo, uh, uh, chemo cardiomyopathy tend to do worse than people with heart failure due to uh, this, uh, due to ischemic and non ischemic cardiomyopathy. And uh, if you look at the data from the uh, UNOS as well as the uh, Intermec, Intermec standing for Interagency Registry of Mechanical Assist Device, they found that actually uh, chemo cardiomyopathy actually accounts for about uh, 1 to 2.5 percent of all heart transplant patients, as well as those uh, 1 percent of those on receiving mechanical heart therapy. Now, Yes, it is completely iatrogenic because no choice we have to give the drugs, but how do they do actually, what are the common problems we face in dealing with this uh, group of patients? One of the common problems we find that uh, is the problem of the RV dysfunction because may, chemo, for patients who are on chemo cardiomyopathy, the RV is more affected than those on uh, non-ischemic and ischemic cardiomyopathy. So when they go for, many of them, when they come to a level when they need mechanical heart support, oftentimes, uh, at least 50% of these patients will require some form of RV support. That means they cannot do that well on single ventricle support, left ventricular assist device. Some, some of them will really need the, uh, uh, the use of bi ventricular assist device. But in terms of the, so, so RV failure is one of the common problems that we actually face. And the other problem is that of the bleeding. But other than that, if you look at the transplant outcome, they actually do quite as well as the other groups of patients, uh, whether it's due to ischemic or non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. Uh, CRTD, well, the first CRT used in cardiomyopathy patient uh, due to uh, uh, cancer drugs was actually in 2007 in a nine-year-old girl that was, that, that the heart function was only uh, 22% uh, after anthracycline for her acute myeloid leukemia and uh, require, requiring anotrope treatment. She was ineligible for heart transplant, but uh, she undergoes CRTD and uh, EF improved to 55% at the end of uh, 12 years. The first, uh, the first, uh, the first, um, we also, so CRTD is actually not bad for a uh, group of patients, even though many of them who undergo CRTD did not have uh, white QIS as a current guideline, all right? So that's one. Secondly, left ventricular axis device. The first use of LVAT in patients with uh, cancer cardiomyopathy was actually in the 1997. Yeah. So despite having an increased bleeding and needing more biventricular uh, support, as I mentioned, um, uh, the curve does separate after three months of putting a patient on mechanical heart device, largely mainly because of post-implant heart failure that the physician failed to preempt or whether there's, uh, uh, there's nothing much they can actually do. Um, so these people tend to be actually quite young, um, uh, needing more inotropes. And, uh, but the key thing is many of times we detect their advanced heart failure quite late. So uh, uh, there's, uh, oftentimes there's not much we can actually do. Now, along the line of heart failure, I just want to mention this case. Uh, one of the many cases that we see uh, every other week. Now, this is a 69-year-old case, a uh, patient under my colleague, uh, Pimping and Jeremy, uh, baseline hypertension, history of uh, CA colon stage 4 in 2017. 
and uh, was underwent surgery and multiple lines of chemotherapy was well until October 2019 when the clinical recurrence was given nivolumab and which are NTPD1 inhibitors as well as a, a TKI. He was then admitted for ptosis and was diagnosed to have acute myasthenia. After neuro consult, he was started on a periodal statement. Uh, cardiology were referrals made because they found that the uh, CK levels were very high and the troponinity was high. And baseline year was actually 50 to 55 percent. Uh, looks quite normal. And he had asymptomatic, but he had ECG done, which shows essentially PVCs as well as AB dissociation, suggestive of an AB block. And uh, so a temporary pacing wire was actually inserted in view of complete heart block and uh, which actually kind of resolved the ventricular atopics. But then uh, he didn't quite, uh, 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 despite being started on uh, uh, immunosuppressant treatment um, and, uh, and uh, cyclosporin subsequently, uh, a, a pacemaker was still implanted uh, about 10 days after the, after the initial temporary pacing wire. Now, uh, this class of drugs is what we call immune checkpoint inhibitors, and it has been is used as uh, expanded exponentially uh, uh, in recent years. The remarkable thing is about this agent is that they have an ability to to um, they have an ability to control uh, cancer that is very hard to cancer because all these wild cancer cells have been uh, hiding under a immune modulated state whereby under the radar to detect, uh, to escape the detection of cancer cells. But when you use this uh, group of drug, one has to be very careful because uh, oftentimes we find that uh, the, the so-called uh, collateral damage is that our own immune system actually may be uh, uh, disrupted and thereby many of these patients may develop uh, different, what we call immune related adverse effects. Uh, largely, uh, it can involve uh, skin and colon, but also can involve liver, lung, kidney, and the heart. Now, uh, this was uh, all the cover page of the, uh, this uh, magazines in 2003 showing how good the drug it is. And that is James Allison, who was given the Nobel Prize uh, in 2018 for his, uh, together with another Japanese, for the discovery of this uh, immune checkpoint uh, drugs. So there are lots of immune checkpoints. Either they are given uh, in a lone or single agent or in combination. And we find that uh, those who tend to do worse are those are given in combination. These are different uh, uh, known uh, uh, immune related adverse effects. As I mentioned, skin and colon are the most common. Uh, in the past, it was thought that the you know, cardiovascular impact is actually not very much, it's less than 1%. But I realized more since 2016 that uh, the incidence may not be that low. And based on recent data, ICI myocarditis can no longer be considered as uh, a rare event. In fact, it is, uh, if it happens, it's actually quite, uh, quite uh, uh, oftentimes quite fatal. Um, uh, so we actually see a lot of that. So just yesterday, I saw another patient who was given uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors and already he has developed uh, impact on his, uh, on his adrenals, on his thyroid, liver. And I decided that, okay, since he developed hypotension, I'm going to do a trop T and he was up. And so after discussing with oncologist, we decided to refer to rheumatologist to start him on some steroid treatment to suppress uh, uh, preempt as we preempt this uh, impact on the heart causing early myocarditis. Now, earlier I mentioned about antioxidants. Now, uh, due to the time constraint, I would just say that uh, um, uh, we have to look at it objectively. And when patients discuss with us, we have to ask ourselves this question and with the patient, does the administration of antioxidant decrease or increase the effectiveness of chemotherapy or radiation treatment? Because some drugs actually make use of this uh, uh, oxidation uh, properties of the drugs in order to kill the tumor cells. Now, does the co-administration of antioxidants mitigate some of the side effects of chemotherapy and radiation therapy and improve the quality of life? And it's also been very well documented, like for example, drugs like coenzyme Q10, and they help in some people with anthracycline induced cardiomyopathy. Thirdly, does the co-administration of antioxidants favorably or unfavorably affect long-term survival? So these are the questions that we 
uh, we uh, we have look at and discuss with the patient and more research will need to be done uh, to address the patient's concern and our concern as well. Uh, just lastly, uh, just talk about this other group of drug uh, complications called rhythm disturbances or uh, thromboembolic uh, uh, phenomenon. Now, rhythm dis disturbances associated with anti-cancer treatment are typically transient and they are not especially troubling because they mostly occur as a consequence of metabolic changes like uh, electrolyte disturbances and they tend to resolve after the electrolyte homeostasis is kind of re-established. So for example, anthracycline can cause uh, uh, AF, can cause SVT and ventricular topics, but many of the other drugs, like some of the newer drugs like ibrutinib and things like that may cause uh, atrial fibrillation more. And uh, now, if you look at some of these drugs, the drugs can, cancer drugs can cause bradycardia, the taxanes in particular, or the thalidomides, uh, tachycardia, AV block, atrial fibrillation, uh, ventricular arrhythmias, and even sudden cardiac death. All right, QT prolongation is something that I always routinely monitor in all the patients because you never know which patient will develop, uh, will develop uh, QT prolongation leading to uh, life threatening ventricular arrhythmias. Uh, it's associated with many anti cancer drugs and put the patient at risk of those ventricular arrhythmias. But many cancer patients often have comorbidities, including diarrhea or vomiting, inducing electrolyte disturbances. They are also on many medications that potentially can prolong QT sites, such as antidepressants, antimatics. Uh, so we have to be very mindful. Whenever I see a patient's QT being prolonged, I re-look at the entire list of drugs and what else are the supplements that the patients are taking. More importantly, we know the consequence is that uh, it, can, it can actually lead to uh, events like Posa de Juan, whereby the patient have, uh, can lead to sudden death. And um, so um, that's something, but the diagnosis, one must understand that uh, Many cancer patients, about 30% of them, uh, have some baseline ECG abnormalities. Now, while ECG is useful, but it's not the end all because QT prolongation is the ECG diagnosis, and we have to be careful how we actually measure it. Now, generally, I would say that in men, what is clearly abnormal is a QT interval of more than 450, and for women, more than 470. Now, if the heart rate is too fast, some of the traditional ways of measuring QT interval by using Bazette's formula may not be so as accurate as using Frederick's here. If in doubt, you know, look at the ECG printout, don't know, ask your fellow friendly cardiologist for advice whether a QT is normal or not, and then you track it with time. And uh, as I say, men mentioned earlier, diff many different things like electrolytes and drugs can concurrently uh, affect the QT interval and put one at risk. Now, atrial fibrillation is the other class of drugs I want to talk about because of the impact on the anticoagulation treatment. Now, AF is, a sec is the most common arrhythmia at older age group. So by the age of 80, 10% of us will actually already have atrial fibrillation. Now, given the increase in uh, malignancy in the older group, so it's quite, uh, uh, it's quite common to see coexist between the two conditions. But once one develops atrial fibrillation, uh, one has a five-fold risk of developing stroke and three-fold risk of developing heart failure. So that is uh, potentially very life-threatening. And then we ask ourselves, why do they actually develop this atrial fibrillation? Is it a comorbid condition or is it because the patient undergone lung surgery, typically lung surgery or thoracic surgery have a high incidence of atrial fibrillation? Uh, 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 whether the direct impact of the cancer growing into a thoracic cavity or next to a heart? And then the other thing about electrolyte disturbances can also cause uh, atrial fibrillation. But some drugs tend to cause more atrial fibrillation than the other. So that we have to be mindful of. And uh, in terms of anticoagulation, this is a tough part because the decision to initiate anticoagulation in atrial fibrillation is not as straightforward and can be very challenging. Malignancy increases both the risk of thromboembolic events as well as the risk of bleeding, particularly if one has a low platelet level or one has any intracranial disease. So the choice of cancer therapy may influence our decision to whether or not to anticoagulate in patients with AF and, uh, and uh, DVT, and, uh, and also the type of treatment. For example, some treatments like uh, uh, anti-angiogenesis inhibitors increase the risk of thromboembolism. So 
So how do we actually then decide? Because we also know that, you know, in AF, in cardiology, we use this risk marker, uh, this uh, check vest uh, tube or has the uh, thing to assess the risk of bleeding and risk of em embolism. But honestly, this do not really quite apply in patients with active cancer because it's not actually been done in active cancer before. So uh, that's the first thing, anticoagulation become an issue. Second thing is about the choice. In terms of choices, yes, traditionally we use a lot of vitamin K uh, warfarin for anticoagulation, but in cancer patients, there are issues, including drug-drug interaction, co-administration with targeted cancer treatment, the change in nutritional status, such as nausea and vomiting, and not, uh, weight loss, and then the use of... Um, so for some of these patients, uh, the use of vitamin K, uh, K antagonist like warfarin for DVT is associated with higher risk of hemorrhage as compared to those patients without cancer. So it is also not easy. And then if you want to switch over to the newer agents like uh, this uh, uh, anticoagulation uh, uh, agents, um, uh, while it is useful, but actually there is not much of a clinical data as yet. So oftentimes, uh, low molecular weight is still using, but there's no data on the long term use of low molecular weight in uh, patients with uh, AF and cancer. Uh, the data is still actually limited. So I think all in, I just wanted to say that the decision regarding the initiation of the anti-thrombotic uh, therapy, as well as which agent to use, should be individualized and weighed according to the patient's uh, risk of bleeding and uh, bleeding and thromboembolic phenomenon. And then uh, uh, lastly, uh, antiarrhythmics, okay? Antiarrhythmics, yeah, some of the patients when it's AF, we try to convert back them back to uh, sinus rhythm. But uh, one must be very mindful of the drug-drug interaction with the uh, uh, antiarrhythmics. Uh, 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 because many of them, such as the class 3 agents, are associated with QT interval prolongation, then plus the drugs actually increase the risk of uh, ventricular arrhythmias. So um, uh, there's no uh, superiority whether it's a rate control or rhythm control, because for, for uh, rhythm control, you have to use the uh, uh, anti-arrhythmics. For rate control, uh, you also have to think about anticoagulation issues. So uh, basically, treatment needs to be individualized. Uh, lastly, I just want to talk about, um, I, last two slides, I just want to talk about uh, this uh, physical exercise and breast cancer. As shown from these two uh, slides here, we know that increasing fitness is associated with the risk of developing certain cancers, such as breast cancers. And patients who have already been diagnosed with cancer, uh, they often times they reduce their activity because they don't, somehow they don't feel so fit whether it's a result of the treat, uh, uh, disease itself or as a result of treatment. But consistently, with, uh, reduction in the, there's a reduction in cancer-related mortality with exercise as shown in this, uh, in, in this two uh, clinical uh, 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 trials. So these are the uh, evidence that just published this year. Actually, it shows that uh, physical activity will help the reduce the risk of developing seven different types of cancer from colon, breast, endometrial, kidney, bladder, esophageal, and stomach cancer. And for those patients who actually had a cancer before, it helps to improve the long-term prognosis, breast, colon, and prostate cancer. Besides improving the survival, you also help to improve the patient's other healthcare outcomes, such as reducing anxiety, uh, fewer depression, less fatigue, better quality of life, and busy feeling much better. So uh, what I wanted to say is that every survivor should avoid inactivity. Exercise is important. Now, many of the time patients uh, treatment after being diagnosed with cancer or going through treatment, they found that they are not so fit as before. And we found that in breast, uh, not just in breast cancer, other cancer patients, they are oftentimes there's just reduced activities and this is reflected in the reduced peak oxygen consumption when you do an exercise, uh, this uh, tolerance test. The gold standard of assessing uh, uh, fitness is actually that of uh, year two max, uh, of, uh, max peak oxygen consumption. Uh, this is a very powerful risk stratification tool. It tells us how the patient is because uh, it allows us to look at the patient as a whole, 
how uh, how the cancer or the treatment uh, disturb the patient and how it actually affect all the complete cardiopulmonary respiratory and skeletal axis. That means uh, uh, that will then affect the patient's outcome. Uh, these are papers that have been published. Uh, exercise is medicine in oncology and from uh, American Heart Association, it recommends that we should uh, identify and uh, refer the patient to uh, for cardiac rehab when we can, uh, which we then term it as called cancer rehab and, uh, in, and instead. So the key thing is guidelines are there. The question is, there's a lack of clarity, even though there are guidelines on who in the community should be referring this patient, whether it's oncologist or whether it's a cardiologist, even though the guidelines are there. So very much, uh, I would actually encourage all the managing physicians from uh, uh, family physicians, to oncologists to cardiologists that we have to assess at each and every one of our patients where suitable, we know that exercise is good for them and we should, uh, where they can do exercise on their own, we should encourage them. If not, then we'll see what is the cardiovascular risk. Is there a, risk for them when they do exercise. If not sure, refer to your friendly cardiologist and then refer them to the right team to actually do the uh, rehab because it's not just about exercise. And also, of course, during this period of COVID, we actually have to adapt to how to actually conduct exercise classes during COVID situation. So we have to make use of uh, uh, Zoom and various tools to actually uh, organize this teaching event. So CORE is what, what the American Heart Association actually recommends, cardiac oncology rehab. And uh, so first of all, you ask yourself this question, how many days during the past week have they actually asked the patient? During the past week, I see actually perform exercise and feel the heart beating faster, uh, uh, for at least 30 minutes or more. If the patient says no, then you know he needs some help. How many days during the past week have you performed physical exercise to increase the muscle strength, such as weight lifting? Again, if the patient says no, you know that this person will probably uh, benefit from getting some counseling. And then lastly, would this patient be safe exercising without medical super supervision? That means you see the column on the left hand side. If they are, uh, I mean, the, uh, if they are able to do on their own, then you just need to encourage them. But if they, you think that the person has an increased risk or some cardiac symptoms such as breathlessness, it's better to send to your physicians, fellow physicians, to exercise their, uh, assess their risk before they start on any exercise. Uh, I must say one thing, this call, now this call algorithm that is designed by American Heart Association is not driven specifically as a specific point in cancer continuum, but, uh, by, but by the patient's underlying risk of actually uh, uh, this um, cardiac dysfunction, that means any time based on the patient, uh, whether it's early in the diagnosis or whether in the treatment phase or it's a follow-up, I think anytime we find that the patient is symptomatic or we realize the patient hasn't been embarked on or advised on this uh, fitness program, you should actually send the patient actually for uh, counseling. Um, uh, this is one, that's why because of that in mind, uh, we started a cardio oncology in 2008 and we decided that it's very crucial for us to provide an extra dimension uh, to take care of this cancer survivor. Uh, with uh, impaired heart function, looking at their exercise, not just their exercise, but also their nutrition and uh, social support. So uh, we, we got our heart failure uh, therapists and uh, dietitian as well as uh, counselors to teach them on how to build up their fitness because we know it does translate to a better outcome. So to me, what is important is the right platform because you know, you don't have a single platform where you only have physiotherapists without a nutritionist, without the uh, counselor to take care of depression. Exercise is not merely, uh, it's safe, it's feasible for cancer patients and it, it allows them to achieve improvement in their physiological and psychological profile. So I think uh, cancer patients should know that they are not alone, they should not be isolated and uh, traditional approach of, oh, you got cancer, just sit at home, rest at home. I think that is not the right, uh, right uh, mindset we should adopt. So lastly, I'd like to say that um, cardiovascular adverse effect anti-cancer treatment are actually quite common and they can exist in the, uh, both cancer as well as heart uh, problems can exist in the same patient. Both share many common risk factors. Uh, cardiovascular comorbidities, because they are often, we should better manage them better. 
and uh, before even we actually start them on MD uh, on the treatment. And uh, while oncologists and cardiologists don't talk much to each other, uh, I think more interaction will be necessary to help to develop guidelines because currently most of the paper or the statements are based on consensus statement and not really evidence, that much evidence, it's just consensus and the expert view. Um, we need to come to a, a better definition of what is cardiotoxicity. Um, uh, I think we all can work better together for the sake of the patient. Um, more research is definitely needed and if we have uh, more research, I think we can serve our patient more and teamwork is very important. So with that, you know, I just like to end with these three slides, you know, um, uh, well, whether it's beer or whether it's wine, whether we look at it as cardiotoxic or cardio-friendly uh, from different angle of eyes, I think very important is that uh, uh, oncologists and cardiologists need to work together. Although we might masquerade as different members of the healthcare team, uh, but all in, if, you know, uh, we are trying to learn from the oncology. There's still, even though we might look quite close to them, but we still are a very long way because the number of drugs they, they, they approve every year is huge. And, uh, and we have a lot to learn from them or to serve our patient better. All right, with that, with that I'd like to thank you. Thank you all for attending the webinar. Thank you, Dr. Chuang, for the very comprehensive uh, talk as well as the lecture, which is very entertaining as well as and informative. Uh, I think Dr. Tan Chong-Hyung is back from his emergency treatment, so I hope your patient is fine. Uh, okay, okay uh, we have some questions first. So I think uh, for the attendees, I, I, I probably forgot to mention just now, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A and you can type it in and we'll try to answer them in the next 5-10 minutes. Uh, we should have some time for discussion. So uh, let me start the ball rolling by answering uh, one, uh, asking one of the questions uh, which was sent off. Should Dr. Chuang, do you think all cardiac patients who are diagnosed with cancer needs to be more closely follow up during their cancer treatment? And what happens if this patient doesn't have an existing heart condition? How would the cancer treatment follow up for cardiac wise uh, differ? Okay. Uh, uh, um. All patients, sometimes when the patient is diagnosed with cancer, uh, besides them going for surgery, first of all, uh, oftentimes you'll be asked whether or not the person will be fit for surgery. And the surgeons or oncology will actually send them back to us for assessment. And at that time, we also have to then determine whether some of the treatments that we have been giving to the patient will help to cover them through the process of surgery and so as subsequent uh, whether there's a need to refine the treatment based on the type of um, uh, cancer treatment, whether a given treatment is necessary or not. So I think, um, yes, the patient should be reviewed. And then subsequently, sometimes we lost, to, a lot, I lost them to follow up. We should uh, be more mindful and follow up with whichever surgeon or cancer specialist on the following treatment uh, because... Um, um, the, the specialist there may not know very well what the, uh, uh, what the underlying heart problem is or so. But one of the tricks I actually do routinely when cancer patients come and see me is the first thing I do is I ask them for their PET data. Now, uh, many patients may not have pre-existing heart problem. Many cancer patients may have gone through uh, scans, various scans to see whether they spread or not. And so I will see where the PET scan is done and then I will call the processing center and ask the radiologist to give me the calcium distribution and the density more or less a rough estimate. Now the data is actually buried there in the raw data but it's not usually reported in the PET scan and uh, if you find that in the PET data raw database the patient has a high calcification score all right then this patient you will need to be extra careful. And this approach that I've been doing for the past 10 years is kind of validated last year. There was a paper saying that uh, PET scan can give you the calcium data and help to prognosticate the patient. So routinely, uh, Maui side, uh, um, uh, the radio oncology department as well as Red Link, uh, they usually get a call from me when they do a PET scan and I'll ask them for the uh, thing. That give you some starting base whether or not this patient is at high risk besides the usual risk factors such as diabetes or hypertension. So that's one personal trick I use. Okay, thank you, Dr. Chuang. 
Okay, I um, got a question for Dr. Chuang. Now, this is also one of the, the um, questions that kind of come out in, in, uh, from, I, I suppose, the participant. Now, sometimes um, the cancer patient receives his chemo, his or her chemotherapy, and then they're kind of well, they're in remission. Now, once they're well, do you still need to uh, surveil them on a regular basis? Or you say that, look, treatment's finished, you know, you can be discharged, uh, live long and prosper. Okay, so um, I think it depends on the, the, type of the type of cancer, the type of treatment, and whether during the treatment there's any impact or not. So if you look at the patients undergoing the treatment that cause the left ventricular dysfunction, if throughout the entire period they don't uh, have any decline in heart function, uh, uh, depending on whether it is a type 1 or type 2 agents, some you might still need to closely follow up maybe in the first five years, uh, every five years or so you do a scan. Uh, the reason is um, uh, we don't actually have um, we don't actually have a consensus guideline around all the big uh, fraternity on how frequent the scan is. It differs from European to American guideline from one drop to another. That's the first thing. So if they don't have any LV dysfunction, yes, you and no increase in pro-BNP, no increase in troponin T, suggesting that this person's outlook is going to be very good. Your follow-up may not be so uh, may not need to be so intense. Currently, we don't have a genetic way of, we don't routinely do genetic screen to see what is the risk of developing uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, heart failure. I didn't touch on that this time around. Second group, patients with a decline in LV function. Decline in LV function, if you start them on treatment and their function never quite improved and the EF never go back to normal, and the heart size remain enlarged, obviously you will need to follow them up closely as for heart failure patient. But there is a group of patients who responded very well, not the main group, but a small group of patients whose heart function start to uh, return back to normal. All right. Then their usual question is, can I win off the drugs? That's a, that's a frequent question they will ask me. And I say that, well, there's actually no data, but we can try to slowly reduce. This group of patients, uh, I, I, I do not take it for granted. A couple of patients I've actually uh, stopped both the beta blocker as well as the ARV and their heart function after six to nine months actually deteriorate again. Now, what is a good predictor of those that will actually deteriorate? Those that actually do badly the first time round, even though they recover, I think there's a higher chance that they will, uh, they will, they will succumb again. But those who EF only dropped a bit, but not a lot, like 45%, and you get back to normal, and uh, they do quite well on minimal dose. Uh, well, there's a reasonable chance that some of them can do without any heart failure medications, although there is actually no evidence uh, to guide whether we can take them, no, 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 no statement to guide whether we can take them completely off if their EF is completely normal. And what you just have to serve, uh, follow up surveillance, but maybe uh, more frequent than the first group of patients whereby there's no impairment in the uh, EF at all. Okay, I think we only have time for one last question. So this is from the GP. Uh, I think Dr. Chuang mentioned about oncologists and cardiologists working hand in hand. I think nowadays we are working more hand in hand. We are not that far apart, but uh, in your opinion, is there any certain groups or certain types of cancer patients that will actually require more cardiac surveillance or is it all cancer patients or maybe certain certain types like breast cancer, colon cancer? Is there any uh, recommendation uh, from our side, from cardiology side? I actually, uh, I actually do not... Uh, each cancer survivor has got his own challenges and uh, different needs and... Uh, uh, even uh, some uh, patients with uh, uh, very uh, very early cancer and only need to undergo small amount of radiation, I still follow them up. I don't think there's any particular group of cancer patients where you can you 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 don't worry about them all the time, you know. And uh, uh, I think our good oncology colleague will tell us. Uh, uh, 
whether or not they are going to follow up that regularly. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Chuang. Uh, Chuang Hyung, anything to add? Because uh, I think we need to probably move on and uh, close this session. No, thank Why you. Why don't you sum up uh, for the attendees the uh, important lessons? Uh, you're asking Jeremy? <laughs> 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 it's, it's, it's a test of whether he's been staying awake. I have good excuse because I just went to do a pericardiosynthesis for somebody with secondary um, sub from somewhere. Okay, so it's quite pertinent to this afternoon's session. So since I missed it, I have a good excuse. Hi, uh, Jerry. Well, I, I guess for um, the attendees today, uh, firstly, I would like to thank you all for spending this afternoon, uh, the first hour with us. Uh, mm -hmm. I hope. I hope this uh, session will highlight uh, a few important uh, facts, like, which I think right now, uh, cancer survivors, is a fact that there'll be more cancer survivors. Uh, that's number one. Number two, as the cancer survivors have completed their treatment or ongoing treatment, uh, there are certain cardiological uh, concerns and complications that together uh, with the oncologists, we need to work together to improve their well-being. Because I think uh, the truth is there's no point uh, Surviving a cancer and trading off a uh, heart failure, which may not be correctable, and eventually the patient still succumb to a cardiovascular complication. So I think uh, the take home message today would be all cancer patients and cancer survivor patients, uh, at most points of their cancer treatment, should have some cardiologist uh, follow up so that they know that they are being treated uh, and their treatment is safe and it's safe to continue with their current uh, approach. So I think that's what I would conclude. Thank you. I think we can say goodbye. Okay, hey, so thank you. Thank you everyone. The, Bye. Next Bye. Session is at, uh, the next session is at uh, four o'clock. So for those who wants to uh, sign up, there, there's another link uh, on the web on our, on our portal and you can actually uh, uh, click in at uh, 4 p.m. Okay, thank you Bye -bye. everyone.